Oh, good evening, everybody. Welcome to Briz Science for May 2021. I'm your host for this evening, Joel Gilmore. Very excited to be back. If this is your first time joining us. Welcome. Briz Science is a free series of public lectures put on by the University of Queensland, where we bring not just the best researchers, but also the best science communicators to share their work and their cutting edge science with the audience of Brisbane and indeed the world. I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the many lands on which we're meeting tonight and pay my respects to elders, both past and present. Before we get into talk, a couple little bits of housekeeping. Um, we are obviously online. There are two uh, areas down the bottom you can interact with us. One is the chat where you can, um, if you want to talk to the organizers, if there is any sort of technical issues, send us a message there. But there'll also be the opportunity to ask our fantastic speaker questions at the end of the talk. And so you can use the Q&A function on your screen or your app and put your questions in there. And at the end, we'll go through as many of those as we can in the time. Right, so let's get started. Now, Briz Science, we've we featured animals in our science talks for quite a while. We've talked about bats and viruses, very topical. We've talked about dogs that might help cure cancer. And we have even spent a bit of time on snakes. But tonight we are moving to everyone's favorite household guest, the spider. So if you are afraid of spiders, well, I hope you didn't sign up for tonight's talk because it is going to be spider heavy. And to that end, I'm very excited to welcome Samantha Nixon, who is a former arachnophobe, she tells us, uh, who now turned spider and venom expert. She's a PhD candidate at UQ's Institute for Molecular Bioscience. As Samantha is a multi-award winning scientist for both her research and her outreach. And that includes the, the 2020 Women in Technology Young Science Achiever Award, the UQ Global Change Scholar Award and Young Science Ambassador Award. More awards than a spider has legs. And tonight she's going to talk about her research and how spiders might help, might help I say, with some of the challenges around parasites and what that means for the future. So please put your many hands and legs together and welcome our speaker for tonight, Samantha Nixon. Thank you, Joel. Uh, good evening, everyone. It's my pleasure to be um, sharing my research with you this evening. And I've sort of titled my talk this evening, um, Fighting Creepy with Crawly, because we're gonna be learning all about how wonderful the creepy crawly spiders are and how we can use them to make new medicines to protect us. So maybe we'll start out by acknowledging, I guess, um, arachnophobia. It's one of the most common phobias in the world. And it's something that I myself suffered from until I decided to challenge myself to get over my fear by doing a PhD in spider venoms because I thought exposure therapy uh, was probably the best way to get over my fear. So at the start of the presentation, I just wanted to get a little sense um, in the audience about how we feel about spiders. So can we uh, cue the poll question, please? Thank you. So uh, the numbers are in. We've got about a third of the audience love spiders. Two thirds of them say they're okay, but they prefer them outside. And 8% uh, say kill them with fire. Now we have a bit of a self-selecting audience here um, this evening, but uh, it's not hard to see why some of our, some of our participants um, you know, said kill it with fire, because whenever we look at the news in spiders, they really get a bad rap. You see these articles that say things like huntsman spiders dragging mice up walls in gravity defying feats or gigantic huntsman spiders the size of broom heads. And of course, that causes some people to have a slightly irrational reaction. Um, and then if you do a quick news search, um, you'll see hundreds of articles. These are all just different articles that I found by typing spider news uh, of people setting their house on fire in an attempt to get rid of their spiders. So I really like, um, you know, this one uh, from Perth where uh, people heard a man screaming in their house and they called the police thinking there was something seriously wrong. And it turned out he was just trying to throw his shoes at a huntsman from the opposite side of his kitchen or um, in a very, very American um, news article, a man blasted a large tarantula with a shotgun while smoking a cigarette. Um, and 
uh, multiple examples of people setting their house on fire. Um, and the goal for this evening is really to try to convince you that you don't need to take these extreme measures. You can just learn to appreciate spiders because even though they look scary, um, you know, they, they really do have the potential to help us. So this is one of the spiders that we do need to be a little bit afraid of. This is Hadronyche cerebra. This is um, one, uh, Cerebera, one of the largest funnel web spiders here in Australia. Uh, and they are capable of causing pretty serious effects. But my goal this evening is to teach you to not worry about these guys. You really need to worry about these guys. So these are parasitic hookworms and they have these incredible sharp cutting plates and teeth which allows them to latch onto your intestines and actually suck your blood like a vampire and these are these hookworms are not so much a problem here in Australia but they remain a huge problem for um, the global south and they result in um, millions of children having um, reduced ability to attend school they uh, become anemic and their growth is stunted and the problem is that for many of these parasitic diseases, we simply don't have effective treatments. So here's a nice um, little selection here on the side. You can see um, Ascariasis, this is giant human roundworm where the worms become so large, they completely block the intestine. Uh, we have, you're probably familiar with the lovely large onchocerciasis, um, which are also known as river blindness, where you have these horrible worms swimming around inside your eyeball. Um, I am a big fan of the tongue eating, um, tongue replacing isopods. And this is actually a photo taken just off central coast, New South Wales. Um, and these are little crustaceans that actually swim inside the gills of the fish, latch onto the tongue, squeeze the tongue until the tongue dies. And as the name suggests, actually replace the tongue and they nibble whatever food the fish is eating. And so if that hasn't already turned you um, team spider, you can also, uh, you also have to worry about our pets, right? We have to be up to date with our treat parasite treatments for our dogs. Otherwise they can end up with a uh, dog heartworm where they get these worms that are filling the ventricles of the heart and spilling into the pulmonary arteries and causing huge problems for our dogs. Now, the problem is that just like bacteria, many of these parasites have evolved drug resistance. Um, so we need to find new treatments in order to protect ourselves our, and our pets and our livestock from these parasites. And for many of these parasites, they affect the poorest populations of the world. And we simply don't have good treatments available. The drugs that we have either don't target all the different life stages, they don't target all the different species. And because they're affecting the poorest populations, there's not enough drive to develop the drugs to fill those gaps but I'm interested in whether we can use venoms to find new treatments against these parasites. So what are venoms? Um, they're basically specialized gland secretions that are injected. It's very important that we understand that venoms are different from poisons. The easy way to remember is that if you bite it, like in the case of this frog and you get sick, that's poison. If it bites you, like in the case of this snake, that's a venom. Um, and venoms are really chemically complex. They're filled with thousands of different molecules that range from small molecules to peptides and large proteins. And they're used for primarily predation, so catching um, the food for the animal, and defense, so protecting them from other predators. And um, to achieve this, the, uh, all of these different toxins target different parts of the body and they're very specialized and fine tuned for molecular targets throughout all the different physiological systems, everything from neurotoxins targeting the brain and our nerves, um, hemotoxins affecting our blood, cardiotoxins affecting the heart. Um, we have things that cause cytotoxicity, so they break open cells and cause all sorts of problems. Um, and the long and short of it is that this enables the venomous animal to catch their prey and also to protect themselves. And the ecological, the evolutionary power, I should say, of venom is really test, uh, is really obvious when you look at the ecological diversity of venomous animals. We estimate that over 15% of all animals on earth are venomous. So that's over 220,000 species. Um, 
And they really do occupy every ecological niche, everything from, you know, in the ocean, we have things like box jellyfish, blue ringed octopus, sea anemones, cone snails, um, stonefish and sea snakes. And then you have examples on land, like obviously snakes. There are also venomous mammals. For example, there are shrews. Um, the platypus is also venomous in the males. They use their spurs for um, fighting off other males during the breeding season. And there's also a venomous primate called the slow loris. Um, and uh, also examples like uh, the Gila monster, this lizard, which is venomous. But the reality is that we actually still know very little about the venomous animals and particularly the small ones. So that's the arthropods. Um, so that includes things like spiders, scorpions, assassin bugs, um, caterpillars, wasps and ants. And part of the reason that we know so little about them is because smaller animals give smaller venom yields. Um, and it's really only quite recently that we've had the technology to be able to study these animals. Now, uh, the arthropods actually represent the biggest biological diversity of venomous animals and none more so than spiders. There are over 50,000 species of spider on the planet and they have incredible diversity in their hunting strategies, um, their colors, their behavior. So you have um, different things like orb weavers that build these beautiful big golden webs, um, the beautiful peacock jumping spiders that you've probably seen, tarantulas, trap doors. Um, I really like the net casting spider over here on the right, which actually weaves a little silken net and throws it down on its prey. Um, and of course, all of these actually have venom with the exception of one family of spiders. So the question I usually get asked is, how many people die from spider bite every year? Is my phobia, is my uh, fear, my phobia of spiders justified? And the answer is, well, not really, because usually we get zero deaths from spider bite. Even here in Australia, where we have some of the most deadly spiders on the planet, we haven't had a single death from spiders since anti-venom was developed in the 80s. And we actually estimate that less than half a percent of that 50,000 species are actually dangerous to humans. So really the only spiders that we need to be cautious of are funnel web spiders, redbacks and black widows, uh, brown recluse and Brazilian wandering spiders. And of course here in Australia, we have the funnel webs and the redbacks. So our primary research interest is really using venoms as natural pharmaceutical libraries. They, they, their venoms have evolved over millions of years to become these really fine-tuned cocktails of different molecules. And actually, venomous animals predate the dinosaurs. You can see that the Ndarians, which includes things like corals and sea anemones, have evolved over 500 million years ago. And even spiders and scorpions have been around for 400 million years, as opposed to the dinosaurs, which really only started to appear about 300 million years ago. So spiders, your fun fact for tonight is spiders are older than dinosaurs. And they've really used that time to their advantage. Um, it, the, the, we're really interested in the arthropods because not only do they represent the largest biological diversity, but also the largest chemical diversity. So as I said, there are 50,000 species of spider and each spider's venom can contain over a thousand peptides. So that leads to a conservative estimate of over 10 million peptides for biodiscovery. In comparison, Snake, there's about 2,000 species of snakes and their venoms are typically less complex, more in the range of um, 50 to 100 proteins and peptides. So they are estimated to have about 90,000 proteins and peptides. So in my PhD, I've really focused on the scorpions, spiders, centipedes, ants and wasps because uh, they have been really understudied so far. So here at the, uh, in Professor Glenn King's lab at the Institute for Molecular Bioscience, we actually have the world's largest arthropod venom collection with over 500 species of spider and over 150 different species of scorpion collected from around the world, as well as centipedes, ants, wasps, um, assassin bugs, etc. Um, and so it's become my job, uh, I deliberately chose this to force myself to get over my fear to actually manage the venomous animal collection here. 
And uh, I have to say that looking after them and getting to know them uh, and naming them so uh, has really helped me to get over my fear. So we have here um, Tiana, this is Hector, um, we have Beyonce the tarantula. And once you have a tarantula named Beyonce, it's a little bit hard to be scared of spiders again after that. And of course, learning about them and their importance in the ecosystem and how useful they can be in biomedical science has been really helpful for getting over my fear. Um, so how do we actually collect the venom? So we typically work with tarantulas because as I said, larger spiders means larger volumes of venom. Um, and of course the tarantulas can be quite large. This is a Goliath bird eater uh, with a MacBook in the background for scale. So it's about the same size. Um, so this is Beyonce showing off in the video. Um, so she, uh, typically we let them run around a little bit to just tire themselves out. So they're less likely to bite us. But spiders actually don't want to give up their venom if they don't have to. It takes a lot of energy for them to produce that venom um, and they need it for predation and defense. So we actually give them a very small electric shock to the muscles over the venom gland. This doesn't hurt the spider, it just makes the muscles squeeze down so that the venom comes out through the fangs and we can collect it. But we have to collect from lots and lots of different spiders um, so that we actually have enough venom to study in the lab. So I've been very lucky to get to go out into the field to collect some of these incredible um, venomous animals. And I thought I would just highlight a couple of trips um, that I've taken. So the first one I wanted to talk about is visiting Gari, which is um, known as Fraser Island off the coast of Queensland. Uh, and people might think of Fraser Island, the risks there being the dingoes, uh, or maybe the large taipans, like um, which we found within about 20 minutes, uh, actually in the women's bathroom. Um, but the real reason that we were there is because under the sand um, are funnel web spiders and very, very large ones at that. This is Hadronike infensa, uh, also known as the Darling Downs or Toowoomba funnel web spider. And the best way to get these spiders is actually using common household kitchen objects, um, spaghetti spoons, because uh, they build a burrow down into the sand through lots of twisting vines and, and tree roots um, and rocks. And so you have to kind of gently dig the sand away to follow that silken burrow, uh, but still have something that's, that's going to be quite gentle to not disturb the burrow, because once you lose the silk, it's very hard to find again. Uh, but you need something that's got just enough sort of teeth to be able to help you break through um, those roots. And we found that actually spaghetti spoons are the best tool on the market to do so. Uh, and you find the funnel web spiders by sort of looking for their burrows. And they have these really characteristic um, webs uh, at the entrance to their burrows. And this is uh, little lines of silk, radiating silk trip lines. Um, that uh, basically tell the spider if there's food or a predator nearby. If something touches those silk trip lines, it's like ringing the doorbell to tell the spider that someone's there. So uh, we do that and we wait to see if the spider comes out. And usually um, they realize that it's something too big to be food. So they retreat down into their burrow. So then we have to dig with those spaghetti spoons, usually alongside a tree or a rock um, to find the spider. And the burrows can be really deep, like up to 50 centimetres. This is quite a large one. This is not a snake skin. This is an intact funnelweb spider burrow. Um, and it's completely silk lined, which allows the spider to maintain temperature and also sense what's happening around them. And of course, when you get to the end of their burrow, they're quite upset um, that we've dug them out of their home. Um, so they usually put on a, an impressive little threat display. Uh, but we just take a few specimens from the wild and then bring them back to the lab to study. Um, so this is one of them. This is Colossus. Uh, she's one of the biggest funnel webs that we've actually um, collected. And collecting venom from Colossus is actually quite easy because funnel webs uniquely drip venom from their fangs. Um, so what we do is we just gently provoke them into threat display. This is where they rear up and say, um, back off. This is not a fight that you're going to win. You don't want to mess with me. And hopefully you can see over Zoom that there's a little droplet of venom on the tip of the fang that we can just aspirate with a pipette tip. Um, so I actually don't have to handle the funnel webs the same way that I handle the tarantulas. Um, I can do it within the safety of um, the container. I don't know what happened there. 
Uh, and the reason that we're really interested in this funnel web spider, they have incredibly complex venom with over 3000 peptides. But there's one peptide in particular um, called HI1A, and that's, this is it here. Um, and it is showing very, very uh, promising results as a potential therapeutic for stroke and also for heart transplant. So protecting in ischemic conditions. So even the most lethal, uh, potentially lethal venomous animals can actually be useful uh, for making new medicines. Um, so another really great trip was heading out to Outback Queensland, Gundicum Pastoral Co. So we were invited out um, to Gundicum, which is an active cattle station involved in regenerative agriculture, um, to come and survey the venomous biodiversity. Uh, and they had really fantastic scorpion populations there. So the best way to actually find scorpions is to go out at nighttime with a UV torch uh, because the scorpions actually fluoresce in the dark um, with a UV torch. Um, and so usually they're really well camouflaged. They're sort of dark brown hiding under logs, but at nighttime, they literally um, light up for you. And of course, they also had um, beautiful rock wallabies. Um, but the real reason that we were mostly there was, of course, for spiders. Uh, and initially we went out because um, we'd had some reports that there were funnel web like spiders out, uh, out this way. And it's about um, a, a five hour drive from Brisbane. So it's not really in funnel web um, range, known ranges. Uh, so we went out to see what we could find. And we actually, again, using our trusty spaghetti spoons, but of course this time it was like quite hard clay. So the spaghetti spoons um, didn't fare so well. I think we had to lose maybe five or six spoons for this trip, uh, but it was well worth it because we actually discovered um, some new species of spiders, which is of course the dream for a biologist. And um, they were actually these spiders called wishbone spiders, which look a lot like funnel webs. And initially when we dug them up, we were quite excited until we took a little bit of a closer look. And um, they do behave a lot like funnel web spiders. So they're sometimes called fake funnel webs uh, because they also put on that really impressive threat display to say, back off, you don't wanna mess with me. Uh, I'm gonna win this fight. Um, so they really show their fangs. And what's really cool is that these spiders have double hinged fangs. So they have a huge range of motion. And unfortunately, unlike the funnel webs, they don't drip venom from their fangs. So for me to be able to study this spider, I did have to physically pick them up, which is really challenging because these fangs have almost 270 degrees of motion and the fangs can move in this direction as well. Um, so it took very steady hands and quick reflexes to be able to get venom from this spider. And one of my projects now is actually characterizing this venom because no one has studied the venoms of these spiders before. They're only found here in Australia. Um, and uh, they are a relative of funnel web spiders, which maybe helps to explain why they look like them. And I will hopefully get to tell you soon about what is in their venom. So one of the most exciting trips for me was getting to go to the Amazon in 2019, pre-COVID, back when we could travel. Um, and the Amazon is very famous for its incredible, beautiful venomous animals and um, potentially dangerous animals. It's, it's a very special um, place to get to go and work where you get to be amongst 300 year old trees that are the size of skyscrapers. Um, at night, you can spot caimans, which are um, related to crocodiles along the river. Um, you have to always be very, very careful about where you put your belongings and where you put your feet, because in this photo, hidden quite well, is um, one of the most dangerous snakes in the world. This is a fur de lance snake, um, camouflaged perfectly amongst the leaf litter. Uh, but if I was to be bitten by this snake, uh, I would be in serious trouble because they have venom that will literally... Um, necrotize your flesh until it falls off. So, and of course I was two days from a hospital, so it would have been um, a pretty tough time. And of course, up here in the other corner, we have the bullet ant, which is the most painful sting um, known to man. And they were everywhere around our campsite. So I was very careful whenever I shook out my boots to make sure that one of these guys hadn't ended up in there. And uh, I was lucky to also see some beautiful poison. Um, these are poisonous and I won't hold them against it. I won't hold it against them, uh, but poison dart frogs as well. 
And what I really enjoyed getting to do while I was there was actually see the tarantulas um, in the Amazon. Now they are a lot bigger than the tarantulas that we have here in Australia. And the best way to find them is to find their burrows and rather than dig them up the way that we do for the funnel webs and the wishbones, we can actually entice them out by basically playing a little game of cat and mouse uh, with a spider, putting a little stick down the burrow and waving it enticingly to make the tarantula think that there might be some food. Um, and the tarantula comes out and is very curious and tries to bite the stick to find out what is it um, that's come within its domain. And as the spider comes a little bit closer to the screen, you can see that it's kind of got this orange hair on the back of its abdomen. And these are urticating hairs. These are hairs that the tarantulas of the Amazon can um, flick to protect themselves. And they have little barbs on the ends of the hairs. So when they stick in the skin and the eyes, they're extremely irritating. So it's another defensive mechanism that the spider has to be able to conserve their precious venom. Um, and of course, when you work in the field, it's not without risk. Um, I was actually looking at some piranhas in the Amazon when I felt something on my leg and brushed it without thinking. And it turned out to be one of these Pompilidae. These are um, spider hunting wasps. And in the Amazon, they actually have some that are large enough to hunt tarantulas. And unfortunately, that's what I had landed on my leg. Um, and I would say that the pain was just blindingly intense. It was so bad that as soon as I was stung, I was doubled over, unable to breathe or speak. Um, and with a whole lot of antihistamines and painkillers, we were kind of able to contain that. Uh, but my hand did swell up so much that I was unable to use my hand for the next um, three or four days uh, until we'd actually finished our trip. So um, these guys are considered the second most painful sting in the world. So I'm working my way up to stinging myself with the bullet ant to find out what that feels like. So the reason I was interested in collecting all these venomous animals, apart from how amazing they are, is because I was interested in their potential to develop anti-parasitic drugs. And so in my PhD, I really focused on uh, four key parasites, so malaria, schistosomes, um, which are these horrible worms that live in the blood vessels of your intestine and your bladder, um, hookworms, and this worm, Homonchus contortus, the barber's pole worm, which is one of the most important veterinary parasites. Um, and it's a, the most important parasite for the Australian sheep industry. And the way that I went about looking for drugs in these venoms was to basically test um, our venom library against each of these parasites, look for venoms that killed the parasites, and then I have to find the active molecule within the parasites. I can't just inject you with funnel web spider venom because um, obviously there's a lot of other toxins in the venom that will cause um, serious problems. And uh, there's simply not enough venom to be able to isolate the active molecule and use it as a drug. We have to be able to make it synthetically in the lab. So once I have that active molecule and synthesize it in the lab, then I can start to study how does it work? Is it safe to use? And can we improve it further? Um, so I was the first person to do uh, really look into venoms against parasites. Um, and so I did a large scale screen um, of venoms um, with, an inter with the help of an international team across Switzerland, the US, um, France and Australia. And we actually found venoms that worked against every single parasite that we tried. So um, we actually got hit rates of between 10 to 20%, uh, which was really surprising and had never been shown before. So it was quite exciting um, that we might be able to find new antiparasitic drugs in venoms. I'm mostly just gonna talk about the Australian sheep industry parasite, Barber's pole worm today. So for those who are not familiar, Barber's pole worm is a blood feeding gut worm of sheep and goats. And it's a huge problem here in Australia where our sheep industry is one of our primary industries. We export over $5 billion worth of wool and meat each year, but we actually lose over $413 million to these um, parasites in the gut. And the problem is that they have become um, drug resistant to all available drugs on the market. So we really need to find new drugs to be able to ensure the sustainability of the Australian sheep industry. And these guys are not just a little problem, they 
when they infect sheep, they uh, infect with thousands of worms and they can actually drain the sheep of as much as 10% of their blood every day. So it can be very rapidly fatal um, and it really impairs the wool and meat production and the overall health and well-being of the sheep. So basically you have these adult worms that live inside the sheep's stomach um, and their eggs pass out through the feces and then they grow up on the pasture to what we call the infectious third larval stage where they crawl up a blade of grass, the sheep comes by and eats it and gets reinfected and continues that cycle of infection. So I really did have the best PhD uh, because when I wasn't looking for big hairy tarantulas, I was usually deep, elbow deep digging through sheep manure looking for blood sucking worms. Um, so the best way to get these worms is act to actually hand filter buckets of sheep manure over and over um, to separate out the eggs from the feces. And then I can grow them up in the lab in a 96 well plate um, and add the venoms and see how they affect the worms. Do they affect the behavior? Do they affect feeding? Are they um, lethal to the worms? And I work with a, um, both drug susceptible and drug resistant strains to look for potential venom compounds that will help fight that drug resistance. So the first uh, thing I'm going to talk about is actually some ants. Um, can you make an anti-parasitic drug from ant venom? So I tested a whole range of different ant and wasp venoms from around the world, um, particularly from the Amazon. So these are some Amazonian ants, and this is a European wasp and a Japanese wasp. And it turned out that every ant and wasp venom that I tried against the parasites worked really well. So then I set about um, figuring out what is the active molecule in these venoms and also what does it actually do for the ant and wasp? A European wasp did not evolve its venom to kill a parasite of a strange sheep. There must be some other reason for it for the wasp. And so the way that we um, investigate what's in a venom, uh, one of the ways we can investigate what's in venoms is to use this technique called high performance liquid chromatography, uh, which basically separates the venom out into different fractions according to the different chemical properties of the toxins. So we can um, separate things by how much they like water, um, their size or their charge. Um, and so this is a HPLC trace of two different Amazonian stinging ant venoms, Nea panera commutata and Nea panera apicalis. And each of these peaks represents different groups of toxins grouped according to their um, chemical properties. And I highlighted the ones that showed antiparasitic activity and did some more steps to make sure that I had purified the active molecules out. And it turned out to be um, five different peptides they were short linear cationic peptides, which are very common within ant venoms. Um, and they actually had not been described before. So um, I went and used um, mass spectrometry to figure out what the sequences of these peptides were and then synthesize them in the lab to be able to study them further. And so when I tested these peptides against the parasite, um, it turned out that three of them were very active against the sheep parasite. At the, they actually worked at the same concentration as the existing commercial drugs. So that was very exciting uh, and potentially looking like we had a, a useful antiparasitic molecule. Um, and then, of course, what are the, the key functions of venoms? Typically predation and defense. So I tested whether these venom um, peptides worked against um, the Australian sheep blowfly, which is an important parasite in its own right. Um, this is the fly here. So the fly actually lays their eggs in the fleece of the, the sheep and then the maggots hatch and feed on the sheep and it causes a condition called fly strike. Now in Australia, fly strike um, costs the Australian sheep industry about $250 million each year. And just like the worms and the bacteria, the flies have also evolved drug resistance. So we need to find new insecticides against these flies. Um, and it turned out that uh, most of these peptides didn't work very well against the Australian sheep blowfly, um, except for this one. So we had one peptide that worked really well against the sheep gut parasites and the sheep blowflies. So this was very exciting. The question for me, having come just back from the Amazon and experiencing firsthand how painful some of these stings are, was, well, these, para uh, these peptides might work against parasites, but what do they do to the host? 
And it turns out that um, a lot of these um, Amazonian ants were actually used in traditional cultural rituals. So you might be familiar with the bullet ant, uh, which, as I said, is considered the most painful venomous sting in the world, where um, boys would have to stick their hand into a glove filled with stinging ants and endure the pain to prove how strong they were as a man. Now, a colleague of ours, um, Justin Schmidt, uh, is an entomologist who has traveled the world deliberately stinging himself with these insects to make a scientific pain rating scale of how much these stings hurt. And it goes from one to four, and he rates the bullet ant as a four. And he describes it as pure, brilliant pain, like walking over a bed of flaming coals with a three inch nail embedded in your foot and then getting shot on the other side. And he described that and I was like, yep, that sounds pretty, that sounds pretty much like what my experience of being stung by the tarantula hawk wasp was like. Um, Justin, how much does this ant near Panera commutata, which is where those peptides, antiparasitic peptides came from, how much does this ant hurt? And he said, don't worry, Samantha, it's not nearly as painful as the bullet ant. It's about a two on the scale. And I said, okay, how does, how does it feel? And he said, it's like all the debilitating pain of a migraine contained in the tip of your finger. And I don't know if you experience migraines, but I do. And that made me a little bit concerned that this um, venom might have painful side effects. And actually this venom is known to be quite painful and was also used in traditional cultural rituals, uh, but this time for women. So um, when girls would get their first um, period, they would uh, be forced to leave the tribe for a period of time and wear a necklace made of stinging ants of this species um, and endure the repeated stings on their chest to prove um, that they were strong enough as a woman um, for the tribe. So with that in mind, um, I wondered whether these peptides might cause pain. And so we have an assay um, with help from Sam Robinson at IMB, uh, where we are able to look at um, how venom peptides interact with neurons under a microscope. And basically we collect neurons from the spinal cord um, in the dorsal root ganglion of mice. Uh, and then we uh, grow them up in a dish and we add a calcium fluorescent dye, which allows us to see how the nerves are signaling. And when we add the venom peptide, initially the, the neurons are calm, um, they're just blue and green, but as soon as we add the peptide, they fluoresce bright red as there's a massive calcium influx um, indicating that the sensory neurons have been activated. And then we also start to see this blue spreading out into the extracellular media, which indicates that the neurons are splitting open and that dye is actually leaking out. And this is just a little graph um, representing that. So each of these lines represents one of these neurons. And you can see as soon as the peptide is added, they all light up, they're all activated. Um, and then they start to lose that fluorescence as the cells are splitting open and dying. So that was a pretty good indication that these peptides might be causing pain. And so we went back and um, checked all of those peptides and it turns out um, that unfortunately uh, they do cause pain. So they probably involved in that very, very painful um, uh, sensation when you get stung uh, by these ants and help to contribute to the ants defense. So from, uh, it seems from my research that these peptides are actually multifunctional. They help the ant to catch their prey, potentially protect it from parasites and also help to protect it from predators as well. So maybe not very good drug candidates um, unless you're willing to accept a little bit of pain to get rid of your parasites. So with that, I decided to go back to the spiders and look into uh, whether we can make antiparasitic drugs from spider venoms. And uh, actually, when we look at the, the venom screens, spiders, there were many, many hits from many different species of spider against all of these parasites, which was very promising. Now, Brugia malai is one of the causative agents of the major neglected tropical disease, lymphatic filariasis. And it's a horrible disease, which is caused by um, these filarial worms that are actually spread by mosquitoes. Um, and they end up sequestering into the lymphatic system and causing this um, disease called elephantiasis, where you have massively swollen um, lymph, uh, lymph nodes. 
um, and the worms are actually living in there and um, it causes permanent, can cause permanent disability, scarring, pain, uh, makes it hard to walk. And you can see it in these people here who have elephantiasis of their lower limbs. Now, there's been a very intensive campaign by the, w, by the World Health Organization to try to treat um, this parasitic disease, uh, but there are still over 890 million people at risk requiring treatment. And the problem is that the current treatments are not very effective against the adults, uh, which can actually live for over 10 years. So we really need to find treatments for the adults uh, which cause the, the really severe disease to be able to help these people. And so what was really exciting was when we tested this um, parasite, I hope that this video is coming, uh, this, uh, our spider venom against this parasite, I hope the video is coming through for you. Um, the, the compound was able to completely paralyze the adult worms at a lower dose than the currently used um, antiparasitic drugs, which was really exciting. Um, but of course, knowing that the ant venoms caused really severe pain, we went and investigated what kind of side effects this molecule might have. And actually, when we injected it at high doses into mice, we didn't see any side effects, no pain, um, no issues with lung, liver or kidney. So we were really excited that this molecule might actually be a potentially clinically useful molecule for a major neglected tropical disease. So as I said, generally, we think of venoms as important for predation and defense. Um, but this molecule didn't seem to be defensive. It didn't cause pain in uh, mammalian predators because it doesn't uh, seem to cause pain in mice. We looked at whether it had activity against um, flies and we didn't see any activity there. So it doesn't seem to be a predatory molecule. It didn't have activity on bacteria, fungi, human cell lines. It's not cytotoxic. So then the question for me was, is this potentially a natural anthelmintic molecule, a natural antiparasitic molecule? Because uh, just like us, tarantulas are also parasitized by different worms. And so this video was sent to me where someone had found a spider in their kitchen, um, panicked and sprayed it with oven cleaner because that was what they had to hand. Um, and as the spider was dying, this mimethid worm actually burst out of its abdomen. Uh, because it realized its host was about to die. And this is a worm that um, spiders can be infected by, uh, in, by eating infected prey. So things like crickets and flies that are infected with this worm. Um, it grows in the abdomen and eats up the spider's organs until it eventually makes the spider seek out water where it bursts out of the spider and moves on to the next life cycle. And I, um, that was the caption that was sent on this video. Uh, because parasites really are the creepy crawlies that we need to be scared of. So the conclusion for my um, talk this evening, thank you for joining me, is that um, I hope you can appreciate that arthropod venoms are a really exciting but understudied area for drug discovery and biotechnology um, that really is just going to continue developing over the next year, uh, few years. And I hope that I've convinced you that spiders are not to be feared. They're not the creepy crawlies, the parasites are. And but excitingly, they seem to be able to help us with potential anti-parasitic molecules in tarantula venoms. So I hope that when you um, go out tonight and maybe you see a huntsman on the wall, you won't squish them because they might hold the key to your next medicine. So to check in um, with the audience, how are we feeling about spiders now at the end of this talk? So it's about 30%, uh, about a third saying that they're the best, which I agree with. You're, you've chosen the correct answer, good job. Um, about 50% saying that you appreciate your, their contribution to science, so thank you. And the spiders, are doing their best and I'm doing my best to help with that contribution by the spiders. And to the 20% who say they can still stay outside, as long as you can leave them alone and appreciate them and leave them be, they're going to be natural um, pest control for you. So just instead of squishing them, take a container and a piece of paper and just gently relocate them outside. And with that, um, I will wrap up the uh, the talk. Thank you for joining me and I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you so much, Matthew. That was an incredible talk and an incredible presentation. 
Um, I'm sure that everyone has lots of questions. So now is your chance to go to the Q&A function to ask those questions. Um, and I'll give you a moment to do that. I'm going to refrain from any more bad spider mite puns. Um, and I'll let you know that the talk next month is the on June 14th. So make sure if you're, if you're not on our mailing list, sign up to that and um, we will see you back next month. All right, Samantha, you up for a couple of questions? Absolutely, fire away. Great. Um, so Scott asks, what is the progress towards human trials of venom therapy and what areas are they exploring? That's a really great question. Thank you, Scott. So there are actually six clinically used um, venom derived drugs available today. Um, they come from a range of different venomous animals. So for example, the very first venom derived drug was actually from a, a very dangerous Brazilian pit viper. Um, and what the doctors noticed was that when people were bitten by this pit viper, their blood pressure dropped dramatically. Um, and then the doctors went, uh, hang on a second, what if we find whatever is in this venom that's causing that drop in blood pressure? And that became the very first hypertension drug released on from the market. Um, and that's called Captopril. So um, there's six drugs currently available and there's several more in clinical trials. So there's some really promising ones. One that I'm really excited about is something called tumor paint. And um, this comes from the Israeli death stalker scorpion, again, a potentially lethal venomous animal. And researchers in Seattle have found a toxin in that venom that specifically binds to brain cancer cells. It doesn't kill the brain cancer, it just sticks to it like glue. We don't fully understand why, but it's only to the brain cancer cells. So what they did was they stuck a fluorescent tag on that peptide, which makes the brain cancer glow bright green. So it really helps surgeons when they're performing a brain surgery to be able to see what's healthy brain and what is the cancer. Incredible. Um, building on that, perhaps, I've got a question here. How does spider venom differ from other, uh, well, I'm going to say other animals, others? Yeah, um, so one of the really cool things about venoms is they're just really different across um, the different animals. So for example, um, spider venoms are really evolved to, to hunt insects and they're mostly neurotoxins. Um, so they tend not to be as, uh, as much of a problem for us. Um, they, they might cause a bit of pain. I do wanna stress as much as I love the spiders and I want you to love the spiders, you should leave them alone. Only the trained professionals should pick them up uh, because they will bite you if they feel scared and it will hurt. Um, but snake venoms, for example, um, are really evolved to hunt mammals. And so they have a lot of toxins that target um, the blood, um, our cardiac systems, and also neurotoxins as well. But they're more geared towards mammalian nervous system. So they have a much stronger effect on us. Uh, and then you have things like... Um, bees and ants and wasps and they have a lot of toxins that are called pore forming toxins and they cause they're very cytotoxic they smash open cells um, and that's a really quick and almost dirty way of being able to hunt both prey and defend themselves from big predators right but we're almost out of time i'm just going to try and get a couple more quick questions um anonymous asks are you allowed to get the amazon species to australia to study uh, unfortunately, no. Um, Australia has very, very strict biosecurity um, requirements, which is really important for protecting the incredible biodiversity that we uniquely have here. So what we actually do is we travel overseas, collect the venom there and bring the venom back. Obviously, that was pre-COVID. Um, unfortunately, we can't do that now. And actually, uh, as a funny aside, one of the best ways for us to get venom is actually to head to Europe um, because they have a very established spider hobby trade over there. Um, and so I did a little bit of uh, research in Switzerland and I happened to um, meet up with some people who ran a spider warehouse and it was literally floor to ceiling um, tarantula cages um, that they were keeping basically as pets. Um, and they just allowed us to collect venom and it's much faster and safer for us to just sit in a chair in a warehouse in Switzerland, milking spider after spider than trekking around, potentially stepping on snakes and caimans and poison dart frogs. 
It's incredible. Well, I keep a good spider house, but that's more for poor housekeeping than for, for pets. Um, okay, I've uh, got two more questions. One is, and this is a good leading question. Uh, Jack and Joe ask, do you have enough funding for your research? Which I'll pivot to say, what would you do if you got your next huge grant? What's next on your hit list? Uh, I think every scientist always says I don't have enough funding for my research, um, but I would argue that's especially true when you work in parasites um, and neglected tropical diseases. So unfortunately, there's very little funding, even for the veterinary work, um, despite this being one of the biggest problems that the Australian sheep industry is facing. There's just not enough investment at the moment to actually progress these molecules, even though they're promising through drug, um, through the next stages of drug development. So if I had more funding, the next steps that I would be doing is um, proving that they actually work in an infection model. So for um, having sheep that are infected with that parasite, um, showing that it's actually able to clear um, that infection and doing more work to prove that they're safe because um, you know, and we have very good bioassays here where we can look for things like pain, cytotoxicity, effects on the blood. But um, it's one thing to do that, you know, in an ice in a dish, and quite another thing to do that in a in an actual living organism. Yeah, well, I hope that there is a big grant coming your way soon. And the work is incredible, so I'm sure it will be. So the final question is from Alex: How many pet spiders do you have? Um, well, we have about a hundred um, spiders at the moment in the insectary. Uh, and I have named basically all of them. I'm quite attached and I think I'm allowed to get attached because they can live for 20 years. So, um, you know, the spiders that I'm working with now are gonna be passed down to the next generation of students. Um, but some of my personal favorites is Hector the scorpion. Um, he sort of recognizes me as mum, I like to think, um, because he'll walk onto my hand if I put my hand in his enclosure. Um, I'm very attached to my big tarantulas and also to my funnel webs. So I've named most of my Sydney funnel webs um, like after the Golden Girls. So I have, you know, <laughs> um, and those sorts of those sorts of things because I think it helps um, to encourage a curiosity rather than a fear, so that we can have this these sort of um, useful educational exchanges. Well, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to share with us tonight. Um, it was brilliant. Everybody, this talk was recorded, so you'll be able to watch this on YouTube in a couple of weeks, as well as all the past Briss Science talks. So definitely check that out for a recap. Thank you so much again to Samantha. Um, please join me in a virtual round of applause, and I look forward to seeing everybody uh, next month. Have a great evening and a great week. Thanks, guys. <laughs>